Welcome to Building the Future. I'm your host, Kevin Horick. You can check out new episodes of the show every Tuesday and Thursday at 2 p.m. If you missed an episode or want to get more information about the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Season 1 of the TV version of Building the Future is now streaming online at buildingthefutureshow.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Kathy Bruner, Certified Career Coach. Kathy, welcome to the show. Hey, Kevin. How are you? Very well. Yourself? Great. Thank you. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. I think what you're doing is is interesting um, and kind of um, much needed in uh, in a lot of people's lives, but maybe kind of before we get into what you're doing now, let's get to know you a little bit better and uh, cover your background, and maybe we'll start with where you grew up. Okay. Uh, well, actually, I grew up in a, a little town in Pennsylvania. I guess the biggest city near that would be Pittsburgh. Okay. Yay, Penguins. <laughs> so, <laughs> Fair enough. Um, big sports fan. Uh, and I, you know, spent most of my life in Pennsylvania about uh, – a little over 10 years ago, my husband and I relocated to Atlanta. Okay. Uh, but, I, but primarily, I still call Pennsylvania my home. Got you. So what what did you kind of end up taking um, after high school and university? You know, it's, it's interesting because I actually graduated um, with a degree in speech pathology. Okay. And uh, I did a lot of things with that, uh, including I worked in the schools in Pittsburgh for a while. Uh, and then I'm kind of a person that just needs a variety to, to keep them interested in what they're doing. So, uh, and also because I had had two children at that time and I really decided I needed to create something where I could be home with the kids a little more. Got you. So uh, I decided that I would start a private rehabilitation practice. Okay. And, uh, it, you know, initially I was a very foolish entrepreneur. And what I mean by that is um, I started my practice because I wanted more time to spend home with my family. Uh, unbeknownst to me, when you're an entrepreneur, usually that time only doubles, you know, from when you're an employee. Sure. So uh, it was an interesting couple of years, but I got the business off, you know, the ground and actually really then began to learn more about running a business and kept that business for, you know, over two decades. I really liked doing that. Um, but again, uh, you know, needing a little bit of diversity, uh, it wasn't something that I thought I ever wanted to do forever. Got you. So, you know, that's kind of where I started. Okay. So, did you end up kind of starting – well, okay. So you were in Pittsburgh. Um, did you start Last Brand Standing kind of in Pittsburgh or was that once you moved to Atlanta or, or kind of walk me through kind of that whole starting your own kind of business? Okay. Well, no. I had the, I had the private uh, rehab ha- practice in Pittsburgh okay. and um, that was an entirely different name, a great business. But, uh, you know, I came to Atlanta and – I recognized when we got here that I wasn't going to be the kind of person that just stayed home and, you know, was kind of a homemaker. And and by that time, my kids were grown. So I started to think, well, you know, I I guess I could go back and, and work in speech. I really didn't have any desire at that point to start another rehab practice. And um, I went to work uh, initially for a company that did speech therapy. And they wanted me to become a partner, and I guess I was sort of like my, you know, maybe my aha moment there. But I really had an epiphany, I think, when I was working for them. And, it's, you know, my epiphany be- became kind of the thing that propelled me to do something else. And, and one of the things I thought about was it's, it's always been for me about really loving what you do. And at that point, I didn't really feel that I loved what I did anymore. It was sort of like I went to work and I didn't mind it. And it passed the time, but by no means was it something, you know, that I was passionate about. Um, You know, I I guess I kind of soul searched. And one of the things I had a friend remind me of is she kept saying, well, you always wanted to write a book. You always wanted to write a book. Okay. Uh, And I began to think about what kind of book I really would want to write. And so I spent some time, you know, I continued to work for them part time, spent some time writing. And I think, Kevin, gradually what happened was. I recognized that I missed the opportunity to provide instruction to people 
and, you know, to engage with the public and engage with people. I just didn't want to do it in that speech therapy aspect anymore. Got you. And, and so, you know, then I kind of thought about, well, you know, what do you like doing? And I ended up getting certified as a career coach because I had a lot of people tell me, you, you've helped people get started in what they do. Why don't you actually make a business out of it? And, you know, so again, sometimes you have your aha moment on the opposite side of where you're telling people to have there. So um, that's sort of what got me involved in doing, you know, the career coaching and the business coaching. And um, from that, Last Brand Standing was born. And, you know, truly, I have really found my passion. Sure. So, like, what is what does it mean to kind of be a career coach and kind of what type of stuff do you work with people um, at your company, Last Brand Standing? You know, I think when people think about career coaching, they think about you finding people what to do with whatever degree they have or whatever really interests them. Sure. And while I think that's a part of it, you know, I look at career coaching as finding a meaningful or purposeful way to earn a living that you enjoy going to each day and you feel like you're contributing to it and you believe it's contributing to you. It's like a two way street. Interesting. So, you know, when you're saying, what does it, what does a career coach really get involved in? Personally, as a career coach, what I want to hear from my clients is that they like what they do. They love what they do. They don't, you know, it's not a job where they go to just to pay the bills. Sure. Um, because I hear a lot of that. And so quite a few of my clients recognize that's exactly what they're doing. They're just going to work, you know, they're exchanging, you know, their hours for dollars, and it's really non-meaningful. So as a career coach, I want to find something people can earn an, a living at, and they can really kind of feel, you know, fulfilled going to it every day. They enjoy getting out of it. It's not that kind of, oh my gosh, it's Monday again feeling. Sure, I got you. So how do you even start you know, like if for, for somebody that's kind of maybe in that boat where they're maybe just kind of at a dead end job or whatever, what do you how do you kind of start to kind of figure out what you're passionate about and creating a business around it? I know it's kind of it almost sounds like, well, just think about it and, you know, figure <laughs> figure it out. But like I think some people struggle with that. Right. Because some people Thank maybe you. don't have a passion or they don't consider something a passion. Like how do you kind of start with somebody? Well, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. I think that um, I think there are some people that automatically know. You're right. You know, they just kind of know. Hey, I really, I really feel passionate about doing this or about this cause or about you know this type of of work. But a lot of people don't recognize that something that they do just for enjoyment or relaxation is somewhat of a passion. Sure. Um, you know, now I know obviously I've said to people, well, if you enjoy playing video games and that's all you enjoy, it might be a little bit hard to find a career just playing video games, gotcha. you know, although you can certainly be someone that tests some products, but you know, I'm looking for people who have done things like, um, you know, maybe they're, they're baking or they're cooking and that's part of their passion. They like to do that. It just, it distracts them. It, you know, it's an unstressful kind of experience. Um, I worked with one client who had a very stressful, high-profile corporate job, and she had been making jewelry in her basement for the better portion of about seven years. Okay. And, you know, when we first started to work, she said, I really don't know what I'm passionate about. Um, and then I asked her what she did, of course. You know, I use checklists, and I use a variety of, of kind of scenarios for people to determine what really motivates them and, you know, what are high interest areas? But for a lot of people, you are right. They don't even recognize things as a passion because they become invested in it. And they're not using it in that way. They might be using it as a release. You know, I, I'm going to, you know, remove my stress by doing this. Or for some people, it's just an alternative. As one, one of my clients said, well, I just write so I won't have to clean the house. But when she really sure. looked at it, you know, she was doing quite a bit of writing and loving it. And it was hard to tear herself away from it. So I, I think when, you know, when you answer all those things about what do I really love to do? What would I do even if I didn't get paid for it? What would I do uh, if I found myself in a circumstance where 
the environment wasn't ideal, but I could still enjoy doing what I did, then I think you can more, you know, narrow down your passion to determining, well, what are you already doing that might move into that kind of, you know, income stream for you. Sure. But then do you also kind of get the people that say, well, I don't really want to maybe turn a passion or a hobby into my career or business because then they might end up hating it? I do. I absolutely do. You know, there there are many reasons that people want to own a business Mm -hmm. or not own a business and just want to maybe, you know, I have people who basically – uh, just come to me and say, I want to know if I needed, uh, you know, an extra couple thousand dollars a year to go on the vacation of my dreams. Could I earn money doing this? Got and you. if that's their goal, that's fine because that's their goal. I have no problem with that. I do have other people, of course, that say I want to replace my current income doing something I'm more passionate about. How do I do that? Got so, you. And, and I don't I really don't think, Kevin, that everybody is meant to be a business owner. Um, you know, uh, in career coaching, the other thing that is important to remember is that sometimes you don't really need to own a business. You need a change of venue from where you're working. Um, you know, maybe it's just you need it. You need to do what you're doing, but with a different boss. You need to do what you're doing, but in a different location, in a different kind of corporation, company, whatever. So, what I want to find out when I meet people is. Where do they feel they will be at their best? And for many people, it's not owning a business because you're right. They're, you know, people want to keep sometimes their hobbies and their business separately. Um, so it really depends on their evaluation of where they want to take something that really interests them. Sure. No, okay. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I think it's interesting because I also think then there's people that almost – fall into careers, right? Where oh, yeah. maybe mm-hmm. they don't realize it's a career. And I, to be honest, I would kind of put myself in that boat. And so it, it's interesting when, you know, like I've had friends where they've struggled for a number of years, even to find their first career, never mind kind of once they're in a career and they're making decent money or, or good money or, or whatnot, where they want to, they're, they're almost like scared to, to maybe make another big career change, right? I think that's, you know, one big factor for a lot of people in trying to determine whether or not they feel confident enough to be successful in, you know, a career. And that's that if they're already not really in a career that matters, even if it was a career they were trained in. And that's where the big, you know, question mark becomes in is sort of saying, okay, I thought I was going to enjoy you know, being a history teacher, or I thought I was really going to enjoy being an attorney, but now I've spent all that money and I'm finding out this is probably not a great career match for me. And there, there are really more people than you know that feel that way. But you know what you said about falling into a career. I think a lot of times when people go back and trace um, more, the kind of skills that help them feel, uh, is that where they were contributing, you know, what was tapped into that made them feel as though they had a little bit of control over their work environment. When they can identify those kind of skills that they had and those situations that let them, um, you know, really enhance those skills, you can kind of put together the kinds of careers where they might be able to optimize that particular skill. Got you. Okay. So maybe let's kind of cover um, what Finding Your Fire, um, your book, is, is, is about. Okay. Uh, well, you know, finding, my, finding Your Fire was my second book. It's very okay. different from my first one. But okay. the reason that I actually did write Finding Your Fire was because um, I was very interested since I was changing careers. Gotcha. Um, I was interested in finding people who had fairly successful careers but were not necessarily all that ecstatic about continuing in those careers. Sure. And so, uh, you know, I set about, you know, probably about two years worth of interviewing some people. And I found some extremely interesting people um, who gave me, I think I did the book initially as maybe a, a way to rationalize to myself why I wanted to be in an entirely different field. But one thing that I learned about doing the book is there are certain steps that everybody goes through. And 
and when you when you're thinking about switching a career or you're thinking about you know using a career and then moving it into a business venue most people understand that they're going to be in one of these steps and that's going to be the time where they recognize it's sort of you know it it it, it really does sing to their heart it really does make a difference in whether or not they're, you know, putting in extra time or extra resources, they have a feeling that this is really where it's at. Okay. Uh, and I've had, you know, I interviewed people that did vastly different things, vastly, vastly different things. Um, I remember that, that one woman that I was talking with actually sold a very, I think she just closed it. She had a very, very lucrative interior design business. Okay. And um, she was approached by someone one day who saw one of her designs, and they asked her whether she was interested or not in possibly um, just kind of revamping a room in a woman's prison. And okay. she kind of poo-pooed the idea initially, you know, and she said, well, I really don't know if that's for me. I mean, that's not nothing I've ever done. I'd never thought about it. And then what happened was um, she decided to go and see the prison, and once she did that, she said all the pieces fell into place. She began to think about how could anybody live in a place that was so dreary, and if all it's going to take is some paint, what will it, what difference will it make? And she did that, and then she saw the reactions of some of the women inmates. Sure. And from that point on, she decided that was her calling, and that was what she was meant to do. And she now has an entirely different business where what she does is go in and literally she, you know, she gets funding and she gets grants and she goes in and she's trained uh, an entire staff of people. Their job is to go in and create beautiful places for women and children in shelters or in prisons where they're going to have to be, you know, with a family or raising a family or visiting with their family. She's totally thrilled. And she said, I remember standing in a supermarket thinking, how will my own family survive if I do this? But again, she was one of those people that when when it feels like this is what I meant to do, you know, it just all becomes then this is what I'm going to do. And I, I heard that statement again and again from people. And as I said, you know, at least she was a little bit in her area when she was talking about design and redecorating. But the people that I um, talked with, I was just amazed at how some people just kind of fell upon their careers. And from that, what I wanted to do is I wanted to give some, you know, share some insight with people on if they're going through a similar experience, what they can look for and how to step by step determine if what you want to do really is a passion that you could probably turn into, you know, either a business or a new career and actually enjoy going to work again. Sure. No, I, I think that's really interesting. And I think that's kind of at least like I can only speak from, um, you know, my own experience. And it sounds like you've heard it from many people, but you almost just like follow your heart, right? Or your your gut, you know, and you basically just say like, well, this feels right, you know, and I think you just got to go for it, right? And I think you know, yeah, yeah. some people are just scared to do that, though. Do you, Or have you found that? I have found that a lot of times and I'm not going to tell you that I wasn't one of those people because sure. you know it was similar for me is am I going to leave a predictable income and start something where I'm going to have to build it into a predictable income having done that once before obviously it was a little easier for me but everybody I think you know taking that leap of faith is hard and, and some people are more frightened than others sure what I, what I think you said about you know going with your gut or your heart a lot of people poo poo that idea of oh you know do what you love and the money will follow but for many people the time they put in and the energy they put in you know the money the resources they put in is really not even something they consider when they look towards what going to a work or a job or a business is going to be like if they enjoy it every day you know they can see the silver lining and what they're giving up and what they, you know, for many people when they're doing this, they're juggling a full-time job and trying to build a business or a full-time job and trying to get the skills to go into another career. So, you know, it, they're certainly putting in their time and their, and their efforts. But I think for a lot of those people, no matter what fear they have, they come to a point where that fear is secondary 
to knowing that looking at staying in a job they dislike is far more disappointing to them, you know, far more <laughs> unacceptable to them. And then their choice is, well, you know what? I don't care what it takes. I'm just going to take the leap. Sure. And I also think, too, in, in certain cases, you don't necessarily have to quit your full-time job, but you can start kind of slowly building some, something up on the side, right? Just based on kind of your comfort level and what you're trying to do. And like, to your point earlier, if if you have a lady that, you know, like a jewelry business or something, right? You maybe right. just have to put in a little bit more effort throughout the week or, or months, and maybe you grow it to a point where you're paying your bills or, or whatever that thing is for you, right? Or you save up enough money and you say, well, I have a year or six months worth of, um, you know, savings that I can live on. And then you quit full time, right? Like, Absolutely. I, I would never recommend to any of my clients that they simply quit a job they have, you know, because even if they feel that something they're looking forward to doing is going to be their, you know, panacea, and that's really what they want to do, I often tell them, you know, it's sort of like saying, well, I'm going to learn how to swim by just jumping in the pool. I don't really need to have any accessories. I don't need to, you know, learn how to hold my breath or le learn with any floaties or anything like that. I'll just take a chance and hope that just because I jumped in the water, I can get across the pool. Sure. And for many people, I tell them, you know, that's just going to add stress and anxiety to what you want. So I really do encourage my people to work out a, you know, they work at a plan and they determine what their business has to get to or what their career goals have to get to before they feel like it's the right time to take a leap and just do that. Sure. No, that makes sense. I, I guess it's kind of like anything important in, in your life. You should probably plan it out a little bit instead of just kind of diving headfirst in, right? Especially if you're in a career and you're making good money. Um, maybe if you're younger and you're still living at home with your parents or, or somebody, then you can maybe do that a little bit sooner. I think there are some advantages if you don't have the bills, you sure. know, if you don't have quite the expenses. But, you know, it's sort of like having a baby. I mean, if you're going to have a baby, you have nine months to plan, and mm -hmm. you know the kinds of things you have to have ready before you bring that baby home. Sure. So one of the things I want people to know when they're planning to move into a different career or into a different business is that they need those preparations in place too so they can feel like they're going to be an adequate parent to that business you know um there are things you just you you put in place so that your feelings of doing something different are you know the anxious feelings the fear feelings are much more minimized because you have had that plan and you do know what kinds of things you're going to have to be prepared to have ready. Uh, sometimes it's financial and you're right. You know, you can live at home. You can save some money. Sometimes it's a big time thing. I find for a lot of my clients, they might have families. You know, they, they don't want to give up going to so-and-so's recital or taking so-and-so to a sports activity. And so because of that, they're probably more likely to be in a situation where they're going to have to give up some time somewhere in order to work on something. And so, you know, for them, we try to develop a plan that is comfortable for everybody. So nobody feels like, you know, mom went off and doesn't come to our games anymore or dad's doing something and now we can never go away in the weekend. So, you know, the time frame for a lot of people is even more critical than, than the money. It is how do I get – because, you know, you can, you can always – do things to get more money. But sometimes it's really tricky to do things to, to, you know, you only get 24 hours in a day. Everybody's got the same hours. So rearranging those hours so you can work on your career goals or work on building your business is sometimes, it takes a lot of strategy for some people. Sure. No, I, I think that's actually really good advice. And I think that's something that I'm kind of still struggling with a bit myself, right, is trying to balance everything that I got going on with, you know, like trying to be, there for my wife and daughter as well, right? And so sure. do you kind of have any tips or advice for people that are, you know, in that place, even if they're, they're you know, doing, looking to do their own kind of business or, or not? Because we all have kind of passion projects that I'm sure we'd like to even do that may or may not turn into a business one day. Right. 
Uh, I, for some of my people, I, I would say especially for moms, you know, moms feel very guilty if they're taking time away from their families. Okay. Uh, but I try to look at typically asking them what does their family really enjoy doing. And for some moms, they have said, you know, well, the kids really like it when they can play with the neighborhood's kids. So I ask them, can you find another mom in the neighborhood who might not even be building a business but would like to have a couple hours a week where she could shop or, you know, alone without her children or maybe just, you know, get her chores done? And then can you time trade? So oh, she will take your children, you know, while you're trying to work on your business and maybe growing your client list, and then you can – you know, your children aren't upset about it because they're getting to play with friends. And that way, then when, you know, it's her, the, the, her friend's turn, then she can take her children and, you know, give her the opportunity to do whatever she wants to do. That's worked out really well for a couple of my clients, especially because the kids aren't seeing it as my mom's not spending time with me. They're seeing it as we get to do something different with some friends, you know, in the neighborhood. So I look and see if they can time trade. Um, that's I've had that's some, really good advice. I've had some clients where I've actually asked them if they can work on an arrangement with their employer where they can either, um, you know, put in maybe four 10-hour days and have that extra day a week. For some people, there's that flexibility. For other sure. people, there isn't. Um, but we look at, uh, you know, a variety of things so that we can get them to use whatever time they are going to have in a way that they don't feel anxious about, like they're taking it away from their family. And I, I actually have a family that worked out a pretty good plan themselves. Um, th the father really wants to go into a new business. It is going to take him a bit of time to get some training as well as to, you know, kind of grow with some other people so that he can go off into his business. And he really didn't want to be spending his weekends doing that. But I thought he did something pretty clever. He, um, he took one child. They have three children. He took one child um, and said each child he asked them to, you know, tell – might find five things they like to do and they put it in kind of like a you know little box and they pulled it out and if one of the things was well his son wanted to go to a baseball game then what he did is he marked on the calendar listen you know here's when we're going to go to the baseball game I've already bought you tickets and whatever and he was able to show his children where he was going to just be with that one child Okay. So instead of trying to find activities that he could do with everybody all the time when some of them didn't even enjoy that he took the time that he had and he created kind of an individual time for each child. And then that child actually felt like they were getting all of that father's attention. And he was able not to feel so badly when he was, you know, taking a half, half a day on a Saturday or, you know, Sunday afternoon and really working on his other business. Um, and he said to me, you know, I have a funny feeling I'm going to keep this up even when I start the business because the kids are eating it up. Um, sure. And he's done everything from vis visit butterfly gardens with his daughter, but it was strictly a one on one thing. And he felt that giving them that individual attention actually worked better than planning family outings together. And he did the same thing with his wife. They decided to just have kind of a, a time together for them, you know, rather than always going through everything as a family. And he said, you know, this is not working out bad. And I don't have that guilt feeling that dad's not around. So, um, you know, maybe that's a way for some people. There are countless strategies, Kevin. I think you just have to find the one that feels right, you know, for your circumstance. Sure. And it, it also, it just sounds like you almost need to be creative, right? And and Absolutely. think a little bit kind of differently about things. And, and like, I think it's interesting though, because I think a lot of people don't think like that. Have you found that? Well, I mean, I, when you're saying you have to be creative, absolutely. And I think what people, the first thing people will say is, but I don't have the time to do it. I don't have the time to write a book. I don't have time to grow the business. And I tell them, you have the same amount of time that everybody else does. Nobody gets yeah. any more time a day than anybody else. It's what you're doing with that time. And it's easy for people to say, well, you know, my friend only works part time, so she has so much more time left. But I don't find that it is a thing where working is the interfering factor. I find that actually... The more free time people have, the less organized they are to use it effectively. Sure. No. And I, so what happens, you know, easily is that it's justified as I don't have enough time. Whereas I think truly um, 
for a lot of people, it's not work that's keeping them from having the time. It's what they're doing with the remainder of their day that's, you know, that needs to be reorganized. Yeah, no, that that's fair. And it's funny because I was actually having a similar conversation um, with a friend a few weeks ago where when we were both like single and, and you know, it, we, we were like, oh, we never felt like we had any time to do anything. But like, I think we're, we, we do way more and accomplish way more in a day now that, you know, we're married and have kids and you have to basically plan everything out. Right. And you, yes. when you know you need, you, you almost don't like procrastinate, right. You have like a to-do list and you, you're like, okay, I have an hour here or two hours here or whatever that amount is where you need to be productive. And like, you're almost I find like I live and die by my calendar. Absolutely. Where, where before I never really cared about it, right? And and I find like as my life got just has gotten busier, I've accomplished a lot more because I'm I'm planning it a lot better, if that makes sense. <laughs> totally. It totally does. I mean, it's a, you're you're now setting priorities. Sure. You know, you're you're recognizing what's a have to versus what's a maybe someday. And sure. so, you know, you're getting your have tos under your belt by prioritizing them. And once people can do that, they pretty quickly can eliminate the, I just don't have enough time because I think that's just an excuse. If you really want something to change, you'll find the time. Sure. Well, and I think part of it too is like, and, and some people might not like this comment I'm about to make, but like, I don't play video games anymore or I don't watch as much TV as I used to, right? It's just uh-huh. because that stuff's just not as important. There's a few shows that I watch um, on a weekly basis that, um, you know, that when they're when they're running new new episodes, I, I try to catch up on them and I stay pretty current with that. But, but for most of the year, I don't watch tons of TV, right? Maybe an hour at night or something uh-huh. like that. But some people come home and, and they turn on the TV and – Watch it for four, five, six hours, right? Sure. And I mean, I think that, again, if you I, – I make my people actually diagram out what they do with their time. Really? They, they, get, a, they get a week of, uh, you know, just kind of assessing each day. Where was I? What did I do? How long did it take me to drive to work? So how much time am I really spending on work-related activities? How much time does it take me to, you know, finish chores, prepare dinner? When am I actually just in the car, you know, just driving around? And then when I have left, what do I do with it? Sure. And it's amazing sometimes, you know, I've had people that have said to me, wow, you know, except for sleeping, I had seven extra hours that day. And it didn't feel like that at all. Totally. But, you know, again, it's a matter of prioritizing, determining what are you going to do with those 24 hours? Do you, I, I'm curious, just now that we're talking, it kind of got me thinking about something. Do you get a lot people say like, well, I'm, I'm always too tired or they're unmotivated to do that? Do, do you get that a lot when, when you're helping people? I think I get that initially from people who tell me why. You know, I'll always ask them, why are you seeking out a career coach? You know, don't you think this is something you might be able to do on your own? I know that's a strange question for someone who is a coach to ask. Sure. And a lot of people will share with me. Well, I've tried, and I can't. And when I say, well, why do you think you can't? Well, you know, um, I'm not very disciplined. Uh, well, I had a lot on my platter, and I just didn't have the time to get to it. I will get sometimes. You know, I'm too tired. I've got three kids. I just, I really, I've had, I recently had a client that said that she's been wondering, wanting to put some of her artwork uh, up for sale in different galleries for several years. And she said the reason I didn't do it is because, well, we move a lot. And I said, you know, what's a lot? And she said, well, about every four years we move. And just the thought that I'll have to pack that up and move it again. So really, she <laughs> was anticipating, she was using her future as a, you know, as an excuse as, as to why she couldn't do something now. I get that a lot. And I tell people, you know, if you've tried something and it's not working, it's because it didn't matter to you. And then and also, I think it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, and sometimes it's the only identity people know. You know, they if you've always said, I don't have time to write a book, then you don't put expectations on yourself to write a book because you've already convinced yourself. You don't have time. You know, you're, you're a well-meaning person. You'd love to do it, but hey, you don't have time, so that's your excuse. And if that's been your excuse for years and years, that's going to stay your excuse until you're willing, you know, to get rid of that 
kind of mindset that says, I don't have time. Sure. Or, you know, I, I, uh, I'm not smart enough, you know, or, well, people always tell me I start things and don't finish it. So and I have to really work on mindset a lot because mm -hmm. for a lot of people, they identify with those negative mindsets. They're convinced it's all those mindset reasons why they haven't been successful at switching a job or at starting a business. You know, they're, they're dead on convinced. And, you know, you have to do a little bit of unconvincing because they're going to end up right back where they are because that's the identity they're holding on to. Sure. You, you brought up something that, that really resonates with me personally as well as like there's been a lot of things um, that I've wanted to um, basically start or do. And until I had somebody that I, you know, needed to be accountable to. And in, uh -huh. in this case, it would be like somebody like yourself or even with the radio show, um, just having to have a deadline of every, you know, every week having to have new shows like if if I was just doing this as a podcast, I would probably never record another one, right? But the fact that I have a deadline to give to somebody, I make it a priority. And I, you you brought up something that that I know have personal hand first hand experience on where you know I wouldn't do things if I didn't have to be accountable to somebody. Accountability is huge, and you know another thing that I think what you said is if I didn't have a deadline. Um, I tell people, tell me when you want to accomplish this by. You know, if you want to give yourself three years to accomplish it, you're not going to be terribly motivated to do much in the first six or eight weeks we work together. Sure. So you need to tell me how soon do you want to have another career? How soon do you want to get your business off the ground? Because, you know, what you said about the deadline is when people actually, you know, I, I say to them, it's like when your doctor schedules surgery. You don't get very anxious about the surgery until you see it looming. So one thing is, is that's important is to put down that date somewhere on a calendar where you commit to it and you look at it every day and you tell yourself, you know, I've got 90 days to do this or four, four or five months to do this. Um, then I think that deadline is crucial. I, I agree with you that I think sometimes you just have to get to a point where you're recognizing that you know, someone else besides yourself has to say, did you get it done? Why didn't you get it done if you didn't get it done? And then hold you responsible for either saying that's just an excuse or, hey, that was a major event that, you know, you didn't plan for. So we're going to be able to allow for the fact that that kind of interfered with your plans. But, uh, oh, yeah, that's that is the biggest that is the first and probably biggest hurdle to getting anybody to where they want to go is that accountability and deadline stuff. Sure. Well, and I also it, it also sounds just talking about talking with you about this stuff is it also sounds like one of the biggest things is almost understanding the motivation or the personality type that you are, right? Because maybe maybe I and I'm sure some of your clients are totally fine with, you know, not having to be accountable to some people or somebody but like for somebody like myself, I need that or nothing gets done, right? And so right. knowing that about myself is maybe the first step, I think, or figuring out what you need to at least set yourself up for success, right? Where if you don't figure those things out at the beginning or early on in the process, when you're kind of looking for a plan B or, you know, creating your business or whatever you're looking for, um, if you don't learn that about yourself, then, you know, you might be setting yourself up for failure as well. Right. Well, that, you know, as I said, that's kind of, I think, the mindset issue is if sure. you don't understand what it is about yourself that continues to promote the very thing you don't want to have anymore, right. then yes, you're just going to keep promoting it. You have to get to the point where you recognize this is sort of my Achilles heel and this is where I really need to work the best. Got you. Okay. No, that's interesting. So uh, I'm kind of curious though. So somebody comes to you, how long do you kind of traditionally work with them or does it really, really depend on kind of what they're looking to do? It depends a little on what they're looking to do. I'd, I'd say typically if I have someone that's just looking to switch careers and just kind of want some pointers as to, you know, what type of career would, do you think I would be best in, or, you know, can you help me find a career where maybe my skills would mesh better than where they are now? You know, it might be something we're working together maybe 
somewhere be, between six, eight, ten weeks tops. Okay. Um, what I'm doing is giving them activities and working with them to determine where their comfort point is and where, you know, what they aren't comfortable with that they're willing to get comfortable with and what they totally are not interested in having to do so that we can kind of eliminate some, you know, career in venues versus others. Um, when someone's looking to build a business, that's a little longer because most people that I see are either in the very early stages of business building, maybe they've sold a little bit, maybe they just have a product and they've never marketed it. Uh, so what I'm trying to do is get them successful from the get-go. Got you. And I want to build a foundation where they understand the steps they're going to take regularly throughout every, you know every every part of their business so whether it's their first product or their 10th where there is you know a service they're just starting or one they've been at you know for 10 years they're going to be able to go back and look at that foundational step and see that system so that they know everything they have to do to make that successful so probably when they're starting a business i mean i have some self-guided programs they can do but when i'm working with a client one-on-one -on -one in business starting we're probably together for about i would say anywhere from six months to about a year okay okay no that makes a lot of sense and i think too um just having kind of an outside eye like yourself um that really has like if you came into a business where Maybe I'm a little bit stagnant or I'm struggling a little bit to kind of maybe grow or, or gain a new kind of revenue stream or whatnot. Um, having somebody like yourself come in and say like, well, you know, maybe this is why or maybe we need to try this, right, where you're almost like an objective third party, right? Right. Well, you know, when I have business owners that come to me and say, my business hasn't been making the revenue I think it should. Or, okay. yeah, I started this business and it was great. And then all of a sudden I just kind of flatline. Sure. What I want them to do is go back and see if they have those steps in place. You know, did they really identify who their market was? Is their message clear enough that their market knows what they have that's different than their competition? And for a lot of people, it's just, you know, hang out a sign, put a, put a couple ads in the paper and get a website. Sure. And that doesn't do it. <laughs> so, no, you're right. Yeah. So, you know, I'm trying to show people how a more consistent approach um, to finding the right market and to marketing to that mar right market and to having the clear message can really increase their bottom line of sales. And once we go through the things they need to do to do that, and, and sometimes it's a little tweak, you know, but for a lot of people that are in business that have never really worked with a business coach, they can't figure out why they're not making money. You know, well, my, you know, I can't understand. I had this good product. Everybody liked it. But why aren't I, you know, attracting new clients? Why aren't I making more money? So that my goal is to show them the steps they need to do to do that. Yeah. No, okay. That makes a lot of sense. So I'm curious then, do you kind of, um, well, I, I guess it really depends on the industry you're working in, but do you, will you pretty much take on anybody and kind of, any any industry because like the principles don't really matter what they're trying like at the end of the day the product or service doesn't really matter like what you're trying to help people with doesn't like well does it affect the product or service or is there industries you won't work in i guess the the question there's a better way to word the question no it is worth i i think there i can only remember a couple instances where i felt that what the person wanted to do was probably um, in an area that wasn't strictly a business area. And what I mean by that is I've had some people who wanted to um, maybe go into a sports uh, situation where they wanted to get into professional sports. And I really wanted them to kind of seek out looking for an agent or someone who could be better at allowing them to use a talent they had in a particular I venue see. for a while they weren't really concerned that they wanted to build a business around it but they wanted to get into you know something that was that involved maybe playing a professional sport um but for other than that i would have to say that you're right it doesn't really matter what that type of venue is it doesn't matter where they're coming from you know they can be an attorney they can be a janitor Sure. They can be someone who has worked all their life in corporate America, and now they don't want to have a thing to do with corporate America again. Sure. Um, you know, it can be a stay-at-home mom who hasn't been in her field for, you know, 
20 years. That part isn't really anything that's different. You know, there's no um, exclusivity of that. I think the kinds of principles you show them are very similar regardless because you're right. It's not so much the product or service. It's how you're going to build that product or service to make some money around it. Yeah, no, I, I think that's kind of what I've assumed, but you know, I, you never know, right? But but you're right. I think that's the thing that I think people struggle with a bit too, right? Is is it's it's almost better to have somebody that, in some cases, maybe doesn't know your industry that well, because then they can kind of give you advice based on kind of just things they've seen successful and 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 whatnot, right? Well, yeah, I think you. I think in any business, objectivity is Im- really important. And even when I had, you know, my first business, it sometimes would take a person outside of that business. As I said, totally. that was kind of my learning experience as being an entrepreneur. I mean, I felt that it grew into a wonderful business, but I had some people that were objective that would, you know, give some tips. Maybe this will work better. Uh, I had somebody that actually suggested one time, you know, you're running yourself ragged. Maybe it's just better to go and have two offices where someone can stay at one office. You can be at another office. And I thought, gee, why didn't I think of that? So, you know, even when you're an entrepreneur yourself, the objectivity of of what other people see, again, you know, we talked about it's like having a baby. When you're a parent, sometimes you can't see the things in your children that someone else who is not with those children day in and day out, you know, it's it can be very apparent to them and you totally miss it. Sure. So I think that, again, that objectivity is I, – I hear this over and over again. Someone will say, I don't understand how I didn't think of that. Or, my goodness, that's a simple solution. But when you're in the thick of it, you know, you have so much vested in that, it's very hard sometimes to sort out your personal feeling, your professional feeling, and then just the objectivity of, you know, is this something that I even can consider working? You know, it's it's really important to have somebody be objective about that. Sure. No, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think the, the interesting thing, um, and I'm, I'm sure you've, you've kind of noticed this as well, is I think at some point, um, and well, I guess I'm curious because I've been thinking about this too, is like, is it better for or do you find people sometimes chase money over happiness or it really depends on the person? I would have to honestly say I don't find people that do that. I have okay. people that want to be successful, but they a lot of the clients I'm working with have had careers where they've made really good money. Got you. They're just not happy with making very good money. Or they'll say things like, I have a lot of money but never time to use it or I don't like what I had to do to use it. I feel like I've had to sell my soul. So I don't see that. I think they're coming to see me when they're ready to, you know, go a different route. Not to say they don't want to make, you know, have a successful business because they really do. But what's really important is that they enjoy doing that. Sure. And and if they make less money, then they're fine with that as long as it's enough to, like, live at, at a certain standard of living. Yeah, I mean, I think okay. it's basically they want their lifestyle to have some joy in it again. They want it to have some balance. And for many people, you know, they're employed and they're making a good salary, but the joy isn't there, the balance isn't there, and it does become, again, I dread Mondays, you sure. know, I'm going to work just to pay the bills. Well, who wants to do that for all of their life? I mean, most people have to work for a substantial portion of their life. So who wants to trade that anymore, you know? No, I, I think that's that's really good advice. Um, but Kathy, we're kind of coming to the end of the show. So maybe let's end the show again with um, maybe mentioning where people can find you online, get more information about your book and everything else you're kind of involved in. Sure. Um, uh, my website is kathybruner.com. Okay. Do you and, want to spell that out just for people sure. listening? And I'll post these links in the show notes as well. Okay. It's K-A-T-H-Y-B-R-U-N-N-E-R. Uh, on that website, I have a lot of uh, programs that are actually self-paced. Uh, you know, I will have people that will have a conference and uh you know, I offer a free half-hour clarity call. If they feel that I'm the right person to work with, we might get involved in doing some coaching. And I might say to them, you know, I think you could go ahead and 
do a program and, you know, coach a little bit beside it. And we, you know, they're okay with just being on their own and, and getting some tips for starting their business that way. So I have a Be Your Own Boss program. It does teach uh, new entrepreneurs everything they should know if they want their business to be successful. And some little insider tips from people, um, you know, who are entrepreneurs that help you get off uh, on a successful business a little quicker and kind of jumpstart, you know, that productivity. Um, so that's a, a program where people can actually do the program online and then, you know, conference with me a couple times during that. Sure. Um, so besides just the individual consult that people can have with me one time, three times, however time, however many times they need that, that's one program I offer. Um, I have a new program called the Encorepreneur Startup Program, and that program is specifically made for people 40 and over who are either in a career and looking to start a business or have already started a business, but it's not going so well. And okay. Because I found that uh, generally if you're starting a business later in life, you already have kind of a you know, a, a mindset and a, and a set of expectations that are a bit different from people starting their business in their 20s. Sure. So I, I noticed from, you know, observed that when I was working with those kind of clients, they needed a special program just for them that could help them feel more confident and get the results they wanted a little faster. As an, I call them encorepreneurs. It's really people in their second careers. Got you. No, that's awesome. Um, yeah, and like I said, I'll post those in the show notes, but I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to, to be on the show, and uh, you know, I look forward to keeping in touch with you and uh, seeing uh, where you kind of take this thing over the next year and be beyond. Well, that would be great. I'd love to be back. I, I'm really grateful that you had me on the show, and um, you know, encourage that your listeners, I do offer a free clarity call. They're welcome to go to my website and sign up for a free clarity call. If nothing else, just to get the peace of mind that what they're doing uh, you know, is where they want to be and, and what they want to go to. Uh, I'm not in the business of convincing people to do something different. I want to help them launch something different career-wise or business-wise if that's where they want to go. Um, you know, I certainly don't want to convince them to go somewhere they don't want to go. So um, I'd, I'd love to, you know, talk to some of your listeners. And they're welcome. You know, there's a lot of free things on my site. They can sign up for free uh, business forums. They can sign up for a newsletter. Um, they can, you know, sign up to get the blog free. So there's a lot of stuff there that uh, hopefully is good resources for them without any cost. Perfect. Well, thanks again for doing this. Um, we'll uh, we'll talk soon. Okay, that's great. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Okay. Bye. Bye, bye. Thanks for listening. The music for the show is done by Electric Mantra. You can check them out at electricmantra.com and keep them in the future.